My name is Sam Wilkinson, and these will be my last words on Earth. I recently got a strange email at work, and before I leave for good, I would like to tell you all about that email and what it led to. I honestly don't care if you believe me or not. I just want to leave something behind. A confession, if you will. I'll try to keep it brief, but I guess that I should start from the beginning nonetheless. So, I've hated my life for as long as I can remember. It started on my first day of school, in fact, because that was when the bullying began. I don't know what I did to deserve it or why I continued, no matter how many times I changed schools. My only crime, it seems, was that I was fat. It was a vicious circle, too. The more they teased me, the more I ate to comfort myself, and the more I ate, the more they teased me. I became depressed and more and more socially awkward. As I got older, I entered high school, and I began to despise people in general. Basically everyone except my mum, that is. My misanthropic worldview didn't exactly help me, I suppose. Let's just say, though, that my personality became less than lovable. I never moved away from home, and I spent most of my days in my mum's basement just playing old video games. Such was my life. <sighs> Listen to me. I'm already talking about it in past tense. Oh, that's still my life. My biggest shame, my biggest guilt, is that my miserable condition made my poor mum unhappy. Now, I've seen pictures from right after my birth. My mum looked at me with so much joy in her then young eyes. At the time, she couldn't imagine what a worthless shadow of a person that I would become. She imagined something different. She thought that little boy would grow up to become a man who eventually would give her grandchildren. She didn't think that it would grow up to be me. I never learned any skills other than playing video games. So for the longest time, I couldn't get a job. But that was how I liked it. I didn't want to be around people. However, about three years ago, my mum forced me to educate myself so that I could find work and help out with the rent that kept on getting higher and higher. Reluctantly, I agreed and pretty much chose a subject at random at a vocational school as close to home as possible. I didn't have a driver's license, so I couldn't travel too far from home. I didn't mind that, though. I wanted to be as close to home as possible anyway. The subject that I chose wasn't fun. It was business administration, which pretty much just meant that I would spend my time staring at spreadsheets in Excel all day. I never thought that it would lead to anything. Not because I didn't learn what I was taught, but because I didn't think anyone would be crazy enough to hire someone looking like me. However, after my internship at a large tech company, I won't mention its name here, but you've probably heard of it, I miraculously got hired. Although I'd suffered all my life, it wasn't until this period of my life, which I'm living in right now, that I started considering ending my life. The stress was just unbearable from the start. Every day when I took the bus to work, I had to see how people actively chose not to sit next to me. The workplace had an open office space, so I couldn't get away from people, however much I tried, and they couldn't get away from me. But for some reason, I had to sit together with the people from HR, the loudest and most social people in the entire building. I had to listen to their small talk all the time while I stared at my horribly boring spreadsheets. And, not surprisingly, they didn't like me. Mostly, they pretended that I didn't even exist, but as soon as I had to talk to them, or as soon as I accidentally met their eyes, I could see the revulsion in their eyes. Jennifer, the young woman next to me, hated me the most. She always greeted me with an expression of disgust and I often saw her roll her eyes when I sat down next to her. She was visually annoyed as soon as I spoke to her. From time to time I heard them talk about me behind my back as well. But Jennifer didn't even care to lower her voice and I couldn't really go to the HR department with my issues because this was the HR department. This is what my life has been like for three years now. Recently, my boss called me to her office. Apparently, a complaint had been made against me. She said that the person who made the complaint wanted to be anonymous, but I'm pretty sure that it was Jennifer. My boss told me, with pity in her voice, that it concerned my hygiene. Well, why don't you just take a shower in the morning? She said. 
I already did that, but after walking the few hundred meters to the bus station and after sitting on the bus more or less crippled with anxiety, I was sweaty again. I honestly just couldn't help it. Hearing this just made me hate myself so much and my thoughts just skyrocketed. The only thing that prevented me from actually killing myself was how much it would have hurt my mum. I just couldn't do that to her. But guess what? A week ago, my mum died. When I came home from work, I found her on the floor of the living room and I could tell that she'd been lying there since early morning because she still had her dressing gown on. She was still alive, but she couldn't speak anymore. She gurgled with a confused look on her once so beautiful face. I called the ambulance immediately, but she died at the hospital later that night. Of course, this would have been devastating for anyone, but for me, it pretty much meant the end of my life. From my perspective, this world just didn't have any decent people in it anymore. My boss, typical of them, didn't let me off work, not even to grieve my own mother. That was the kind of asshole that she was, but it was just as well. Staying home would have just reminded me of my mum, and everyone knew what had happened when I came to the office. I could tell from the atmosphere. No one gave me their condolences. I imagined shooting myself in the head, blowing my brains out right in front of everybody, but I didn't own a gun. Instead, my actual plan was to jump out of the window. After all, we sat 50 floors up. There was no way that I would survive a fall like that. I had never felt so sure about it before and I made my decision. And it was at that moment that I received that strange email. As I said, this was a week ago now. The email began, here's your access to the forest. A username and a password followed and at the bottom it said, regards, leaf. Leaf was using a company email, so I assumed that he was from IT and that they had started using a new software or system. I did find it odd that he didn't explain what it was, though. I didn't put too much thought into it, though, and just assumed that it had already been explained at some meeting where I hadn't paid any attention. I asked Jennifer if she knew what it was, and she shook her head with typical attitude and said no with the kind of tone you use when a creep asks you out on a date. As always, I pretended like it was nothing, but inside I couldn't help but feel as worthless as she thought I was. I took a quick look at the window and told myself to just do it. However, I wanted to wait until my mum's funeral. Soon, I thought, and tried to picture Jennifer's reaction to seeing me jump. When I closed Excel a few hours later, just before lunch, I noticed a new shortcut on the desktop. The icon depicted a few pixelated trees. The forest, it was called. I thought it was kind of strange that it had just appeared out of nowhere. Usually I had to bring the computer down to the IT department to install new software. But with nothing else to do, I clicked on the file. A program that reminded me of how software used to look in the 90s opened up in front of me. It didn't have that much content. There was a window that streamed what looked like a live video of a forest or something. I was able to use the mouse to look around 360 degrees, but other than that, there wasn't much that I could do to interact with it. The video quality was pretty low, but it didn't look computer animated. But I soon got the impression that it must have been a computer game because under the stream there was a bar that let you see the speed of time. However, I soon got the impression that it must have been a computer game because under the stream there was a bar that let you set the speed of time. You could view the feed in real time, which was set as default, or increase the speed of time all the way up to 100 years per second. Beneath the speed settings, there were only two buttons, import and export, and that was all. In the menu, there weren't that many options as well, just about and quit. So I clicked on about and it just said made by leaf. I played around with the program and pressed import and surprisingly a catalog with all the employees of my company popped up. I figured that it was connected to Outlook where a similar catalog was accessible. There was a search bar to make it easier to find who you were looking for. I looked up and saw my boss walk by so I closed the program immediately. 
I went home that day without opening the program again, afraid that my boss would ask me back to her office again. And at home, I honestly didn't think much of the forest. I had more pressing things on my mind, to say the least. I was going to inherit my mum's house, but not that much money. I knew that I would never be able to pay the rent and the other expenses by myself, and I didn't have any motivation to do anything about it either. But thinking about this, I lay down on the sofa in the living room, looking at the spot on the floor where I'd found my mum reduced to a confused shell of her former self. From now on, I wasn't just falling apart mentally, but physically as well. Soon, I would lose the house, and most likely, end up on the street. I didn't plan on doing that though, and I fell asleep and saw the window at work in my dreams. It wasn't a nightmare, but the true nightmare would start as soon as I woke up. The next day, I came to work one hour earlier than everybody else. Usually, I avoided coming in that early, but now I didn't really want to spend too much time at home. Seeing the shortcuts of the forest on my desktop made me curious again, though, so I opened it. Everything looked the same, except that it was nighttime in the forest now. The moon was more orange than our moon, shone a sandy yellow on the leaves of the trees. I increased the speed of time to a few minutes per second, and nothing changed. But... I soon realized that the clouds passing in front of the moon moved faster than before. Neat, I thought, without any actual emotion attached to it. After that, I tried to press the export button. The same kind of window popped up when I'd pressed import, but with no names in it. I went to the import window and looked at the list of names, and pondered what this was all about. Eventually, I decided to humor myself and search for Jennifer. I selected her name and pressed import, and a dial box showed up. Are you sure you want to import Jennifer Norman into the forest? I pressed yes. Jennifer's name disappeared from the list, and I chuckled to myself, although I couldn't muster any actual joy, thinking that this program must have been some pretty funny inside joke down at the IT department. I went to the export window again, and as I expected, Jennifer's name could be seen there now. Suddenly, my boss entered the office together with one of our colleagues, and I quickly shut down the forest, opened Excel, and pretended to work. More and more of my colleagues arrived, but not Jennifer. And at first, I thought she was late for work, which wasn't unusual for her, and when she hadn't shown up before lunch, I assumed she was sick. I had a burger for lunch down the street that day. But they didn't serve the best food, far from it, but it was the only place where I knew that no one from my work would eat. In the year 2525, played from the ceiling. I sat there, eating my burger and drinking my soda while I listened to the song and thought about jumping out of the window. I thought that I would do it at the end of the week, maybe on Friday, one day after the funeral. Back at work, my boss came to the HR department and asked if anyone had seen Jennifer. Apparently, she hadn't called in sick after all, and it wasn't until now that my brain went to that impossible place. Did this have something to do with what I had done in that program? Obviously not, but just in case, in some superstitious carefulness, I opened the forest and exported her. Are you sure you want to export Jennifer Norman from the forest? I clicked yes. She disappeared from the list and appeared the names in the import window again. One hour later, Jennifer stepped into the office. I figured that she had just been late after all, just unusually so. But as she got closer, something just seemed off about her though. One of my colleagues, a friend of hers, stood up and ran toward her. Jennifer, she exclaimed. What happened to you? I look up to see the interaction. Ah, uh, I... I don't know, Bella. I overslept. Just just woke up and and I got here as quickly as I could, but I don't think I'm very well. I think I have to talk to the boss about... What happened to your face? Bella continued without listening. Is, is that real? And your clothes? Have you seen yourself in the mirror today? My God. I looked at Jennifer's face. It was crossed by a pretty nasty scar, and her clothes looked old and torn, almost as if she had them on forever. What? What do you mean? 
Jennifer said and brought a hand up to her face. What? She ran into the bathroom, presumably to look herself in the mirror, and a few seconds later, she screamed and just came running out crying. Everyone stood up, even me, and watched her leave the office in a panic. And at that moment, it dawned on me. The time. It was set to several hours per second in the forest. I did some quick calculations in my head. If this had anything to do with me importing her, she would have been inside the forest for more than three years. While I sat and ate my burger down the street that day, listening to In the Year 2525, she had spent her years inside for... No, it couldn't be real. That's ridiculous. Jennifer didn't come back to the office the next day. Her husband, I soon understood from the inevitable gossip, had called in and said that she wouldn't be able to come back to work for a while. I arrived at the office even earlier this day. I opened the forest. It was still set to a few hours per second. I pulled it back to real time. Some birds, larger than my birds I've ever seen, flew in formation in the sky. I sped up time again, this time to a few days per second. The birds quickly disappeared from the sky and the moon replaced the sun and vice versa in close succession. The trees moved as if seen on a video being fast forwarded. And this just couldn't be a real forest, I thought. It just couldn't. Again, though, I slowed down time to normal. Thomas, a guy from the economy department that had always made silly jokes at my expense, came to the office that day. I looked at him as he walked towards his office space with his leather briefcase in his hand and his expensive watch around his wrist. He looked at me. I nodded, but he ignored me. I couldn't see his office space from where I was sitting, but as soon as he had passed by, I heard him placing his briefcase on his desk and opening it. I made sure the time was set to default, and then I pressed import. Thomas Washmeister. I typed in the search bar, and then I imported him. Are you sure you want to import Thomas Washmeister into the forest? I was. And as soon as his name disappeared from the list, I carefully walked around the corner. And his briefcase was lying on his desk, but he was nowhere to be seen. I went back to my computer. I looked at the video stream of the forest. It was in the middle of the day there now, and I slowly moved the camera 360 degrees to try and see if I could see Thomas somewhere. If I'm being honest, it made me feel like an idiot even trying this, giving how impossible it all was. I didn't see him anywhere, but I did see some weird animals. Two kind of bluish giraffe-looking things walking by. The low resolution made it near impossible to tell if they were real or animated or not. But given that they were blue giraffes of sort, I just had to assume the latter. Thomas had probably just gone to the bathroom, but... Nonetheless, I made sure to export him, and as soon as I did that, I heard something from the office space. I sneaked back there to take a look. Thomas was standing up, seemingly confused. His usually water-combed hair was scruffy as if he had just woken up. Uh, hey Thomas, I said. He looked at me, surprised that he wasn't alone. Oh, uh, I, I think I fainted he said, blushing a little. What do you mean? I said. Are you okay? Well, uh, I was just about to turn on my computer when suddenly I was just lying on the floor. Uh, really? I looked down, trying to come up with something to say. Uh, do you remember anything from the last couple of minutes? He looked at his watch. Uh, no, uh, I, I blacked out. I excused myself, telling him that it probably wasn't anything to worry about, and went back to my computer. I must admit, too, that I felt a bit excited for the first time in a long time, although I still didn't dare to believe it. My colleagues started dropping in, and I couldn't open the forest again for the rest of the day without anyone seeing it. And during the day, there was some more talk about Jennifer, and most of what I heard seemed to be rumours, and no one talked to me about it, of course, but it was difficult not to hear the whispers around me. One of Jennifer's closest friends at the office said that she called her and that it had been difficult to understand her. She had been obsessed with a certain nightmare that had returned to her as soon as she fell asleep. 
Something about being haunted by monsters deep inside a forest. And at this point, it all started to seem too strange to be just a coincidence. Was I responsible for Jennifer's condition? It made me feel kind of weird. On the one hand, I never imagined myself doing something to harm anyone. I've never been a violent guy, but on the other hand, thinking that one of my tormentors had been forced to spend three years alone inside of a monstrous forest, it gave me some kind of satisfaction. I didn't dare to import anyone else the next day though. I continued to contemplate my suicide, but more often than not, those thoughts were interrupted by my thoughts about the forest. I spent two days looking at it, playing with the speed of time. I increased it to the max and saw the seasons flicker in and out. The trees grew and died and were replaced by new trees. At one point, there was a flash of light and all the trees were suddenly gone. I slowed down the speed. There had been a huge fire, it seemed. I sped up time again and after maybe a minute, the trees grew up again and soon it was as if nothing had happened at all. Most of the creatures I saw, weirdly enough, reminded me more of monsters than of animals. I saw an enormous white centipede with hundreds of red eyes and I saw some kind of snail or blob devouring a creature that reminded me of a huge stick insect. At one point, one of the blue giraffe things came close enough to the camera for me to see that it didn't have a head, just randomly placed mouths along its neck, all filled with these vicious teeth. Sitting in the safety of my office, watching these horrific creatures hunting each other on my screen, it gave me a, an odd feeling of coziness, like being inside during a storm. And there were a lot of storms inside of the forest. Sometimes they raged for years and I had to speed up time to see the end of it. When turning the camera upward during these storms, I could see a purple nuance with the heavy clouds. All of this mesmerized me to such an extent that I didn't think much out of the window, but I still knew that my life was over and I didn't really have a choice. During Thursday, yesterday, I continued to observe the forest. Again, I pressed about. Made by leaf. Who was he, though? I spent the better part of the day trying to figure that out. I opened his email to me again, copied his email address, and tried to find him in the list of employees. However, he just didn't show up. Even though he had one of the company's email addresses, he didn't seem to be registered as an employee. I checked documents going several years back, but without any luck. The name Leaf just never came up. I thought that maybe he resigned or something but he still should have been seen in some of the records that I checked. Eventually, I just gave up trying to find him and went home without getting any significant work done that day at all. Today, I was supposed to attend my mum's funeral. It would have been an important day for me, a day that could have been for me some kind of closure. However, my boss wouldn't give me the day off. She said that I hadn't sent him my application for taking the day off in time and perhaps she was right, but come on. It was my mum's funeral for crying out loud. Of course, I planned on just calling in sick and going anyway, but something in me just snapped when she did this. I just couldn't take it anymore. It had to stop. My boss and my colleagues and the company at large was a cancer, and not just in my life, but on society as well. All the hate that I had built up over the years just suddenly surfaced in a way that I didn't even think was possible. Before this day, I had no idea how it felt to be one of those guys who come into the office one day with a machine gun, but now I did. Of course, I didn't own a machine gun, but I did have something else. The forest. I arrived early at the office that day. I knew most of my colleagues were still asleep, and today they would wake up to a new surrounding. For some reason, my boss was in her office, though. She couldn't see me from where she was, but I could hear her on the phone. It seemed to be an important call, and it was probably the reason she had come to work so early today. I opened the forest. A storm was pouring its purple rain over the trees, and for a few seconds, I hesitated. My plan was simple. I would import the people that I hated, which was pretty much everyone, into the nightmare on my screen, and then I would open the window and end my own life. 
knowing that all of the despicable people in my life would be consumed by monsters one by one. In a way, it was symbolic to do it on the day of my mum's funeral. My hesitation didn't last long though. I pressed import and typed in the name of my boss in the search bar. The program asked if I was sure and I listened to her voice while she was talking on the phone and clicked yes. Uh, yes, I know about the recession, but we still have to... Uh, she suddenly went silent. It gave me goosebumps and I walked to her office. The phone was lying on her desk and I could hear a man on the other end of it. Hello? Where did you go? I hung up the phone and returned to my desk. I looked around the forest, but I didn't see my boss anywhere. After this, I started to import the rest of my colleagues, Jennifer included. It gave me the kind of enjoyment that I suppose anyone would feel finally getting back at their enemies. Since I was going to kill myself anyway, I didn't really consider the consequences of my actions. I just let my destructive impulses guide me completely. After I had imported the entire HR department, I just couldn't stop myself. Instead, I continued to import people at the company. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I said to myself while well, I imported people I didn't even know. It was enough for me that they even worked at this company. My hate had consumed me at this point and after a while, people started showing up on the screen. Jennifer was walking around in front of the camera. She stepped up to it and screamed something, but since there wasn't any sound, I couldn't tell what she was saying. And then, something came down from the sky and grabbed her. She fell down a few meters away, seemingly still alive. After that, I saw three men, still in their pajamas, running past the camera, hunted by what looked like a spider, but was really just eight legs coming out of the back of a corpse belonging to one of the blue giraffes. I don't know why... Perhaps the severity of the situation became more obvious now when I could actually see the people in the forest, but I started to cry. It was a cry mixed with just so many different emotions, but mostly with sorrow and hate. But I just kept importing people and after a while I realized that I could select more than one person at a time. I selected a random amount out of the thousands of employees in the list. It said, are you sure you want to import 167 subjects into the forest? Fucking yes. I felt empty inside after I clicked yes. Like nothing even mattered to me anymore. My last sliver of humanity had finally been lost. With a cold heart, watching my confused colleague seeking safety from the storm in the forest, I increased the speed of time to a few days per second. It went too fast for me to see anyone when suddenly a dialogue box popped up. James O. Nilsson is about to expire. Do you wish to export? I pressed no. And now I knew that I had killed. This happened a few more times until I just put the speed at maximum. Immediately a new dialogue box appeared. 210 subjects are about to expire. Do you wish to export? Again, I pressed no. I went to the export list and saw that it was completely empty. I considered importing even more people, but decided my deed was done for now. There was only one thing left for me to do, and I looked at the window. My decision to jump didn't have that much to do with what I had done. It wasn't a coward's escape from the police or anything. I knew that no one would be able to figure out where all those people went anyway. I would never really get caught. My death was supposed to be the end of my suffering and that was why I still planned on going through with it. And now was the time. Before I walked up to the window that I had fantasized about jumping out for so long, I dragged the speed back to normal in the program. It was a sunny day in the forest. To my surprise, I could see a stream of smoke coming from the ground a few hundred meters away. I couldn't tell what its source was, but after a few minutes, I realized that it was people sitting around a fire. Later, one of them walked up to the camera, and it was a man. He was wearing a, an animal skin and carrying a spear of some sort. A woman walked up next to him, and they looked almost prehistoric. 
They kneeled in front of the camera and placed what looked like a piece of meat on the ground in front of it. Was it uh, an offering? My first thought was that these people had always lived in the forest, but then it dawned on me that they must have been the descendants of the people that I imported. Somehow they must have survived long enough to have children. I decided to prolong my death a bit so that I could watch these people, but they didn't do much more though. After they had placed the meat, they walked back to their camp and then they disappeared. So I sped up time again and a few years per second this time. After about 50 years, I slowed down again. But this time there was some kind of altar around the camera made by rocks and flowers and I could see more campfires burning in the distance. I was fascinated by the fact that these people lived so primitive lives given that their forefathers were modern people. I then realized that everyone I had imported into the forest had been office workers. Their knowledge of Excel wouldn't have been very useful in the wild. With a burning curiosity, I sped up time once again. This time, I allowed for a few hundred years to pass. But when I put the speed back to default... The first thing that I noticed was that the altar had been changed. This time, it looked more like a structure. Stones placed upon each other, but still in a primitive way. The people looked about the same, still wearing animal skins as clothes and wielding spears. This time, however, I noticed a woman carrying what looked like a bow and arrows. They were still in the Stone Age though, so I sped up time yet again, and this time I let approximately 3,000 years pass before I returned the settings to normal again. This only took about half a minute on my end, with the speed setting put at maximum. To my surprise, the inhabitants still hadn't passed the Stone Age. The altar was a bit more advanced though, and it now resembled a stone hedge of sorts. A bit disappointed at their slow development, an idea formed in my head. Now, driven by curiosity more than hate, I pressed import again. I knew that I was about to change someone's life with my actions and do so without their consent, but it somehow didn't feel like a big deal anymore. I suppose I had gotten used to it by now, and I looked up the smartest people I knew among the employees. There was only three of them. Depressing, I know. A medical doctor who had changed her career midlife an engineer who had worked on some of the company's more experimental projects, such as the development of more sustainable energy sources, and a cleaner who had worked as a dentist in her home country. I imported them and sped up time for a few minutes, letting half a century pass in the forest while I barely had time to scratch my head. And this time, things changed dramatically. The people didn't seem to live like nomads anymore, but in villages. At least there was a village built around the camera, so I assumed that there must have been more of them. Finally, it looked like the inhabitants had become farmers. They were using carts with wheels, and I even saw them riding one of the blue giraffes like a horse. The small guilt that I had felt when importing the three more knowledgeable individuals quickly disappeared when I saw what they had contributed to during their stay inside the forest. I spent about an hour watching the people in the village until I sped up time again. I took my time too since I knew that my colleagues wouldn't come in for work that day. When I set the speed back to normal, the people were living in what could only be regarded as a town. It still looked like a village, but it was bigger and had objects made of metal in it, such as weapons and tools. Perhaps this was equivalent to the Bronze Age. About 20 people, dressed in white robes, were praying around the camera as well. They reminded me of maybe a mixture of Hindus and Muslims, but their religious devotion to the camera made me feel important in a way that I had never felt before. After all, these people wouldn't have been born without me. And in a way, I truly was their god. And a part of me felt like it too. I sped up time and once again I noticed that nothing much happened. Development was slow. At one time, the camera was actually trapped within a set of walls. I couldn't see anything, but since I was watching the forest at a speed of one year per second, the walls quickly disappeared. Why had they been there in the first place? Had there been some kind of change in their religion? Houses went up and down, storms came and went, and after a while, I witnessed the first war. 
I slowed down time, but the war went by just so fast that it ended before I could see any of it in real time. The town was burning and people, women and children, lay dead on the ground while people with paint on their faces walked around with spears longer than the ones that I had seen before. Blue giraffes with empty saddles were feasting on the corpses with their long terrifying necks. I decided to increase the speed of time to 100 years per second again. It was impossible to see any individual actions, but the town grew and then it was seemingly destroyed for a fraction of a second, and then it reappeared even bigger than before. This was repeated several times and after about a minute on my end, 6,000 years in the forest mind you, I slowed down the speed of time again. The town was an ancient city now, looking like what I had imagined Athens must have looked like back in the day. I noticed the flag of this civilization. It was black with a golden tower in the center. Perhaps it depicted the camera, I thought. After all, I had never seen the camera and I didn't know what it looked like. As I let time speed up again, this city was destroyed and rebuilt a few times as well. Hey, uh, where is everybody? It was the janitor, a guy that always joked about my weight. Oh, uh, I said out of surprise. I have no idea. I tabbed down the forest. Hey, uh, what was that? He said. Some kind of game? N no, come on, let me see it. I nervously brought the program up on the screen again. The forest? Huh. Uh, yeah, it kind of just appeared on my computer, I said. I admit that I panicked and I didn't know what else to say but the truth. So, what do you do then? Is it kind of like Age of Empires or something? Uh, yeah, I said hesitantly. No, not really. I don't really know what it is, to be honest. I felt a drop of sweat running down my cheek. Well, you aren't supposed to play games at work, you know. That's probably why you're so fat. You need to stop playing all those computer games all day and hit the gym, man. He laughed. It isn't really a game, I said, ignoring his insult. Look, there are only two options, import and export. And hey, look, if I press import, I get this list of everyone that works here. I opened the list. Really? He said. That's weird. Yeah, everyone is on the list. Look. I typed in his name. Here's you. You're on the list. Well, what happens if you press import? I... I don't know. Let's try it. I selected his name and pressed import. The usual dialog box appeared. Are you sure you want to import Ignacio Gonzalez into the forest? Ignacio laughed. This is some really strange shit, man. I... I clicked yes. I never saw him disappear, even though he stood right next to me. I didn't see him vanish. He was just gone. It almost felt like he had never even been there at all. I quickly sped up time again. And then it read, Ignacio Gonzalez is about to expire. Do you wish to export? I absently clicked no and let time fly by in the forest at full speed. Given what I knew about the history on Earth, I assumed that the civilization inside the forest would soon mimic my own civilization. And a minute later, I saw that I was right. The city had gone from ancient to modern in only 60 seconds. I didn't see any skyscrapers or anything though. The camera was inside what looks like a huge military facility or something now. People that look like scientists walked around it, doing different kinds of measurements. For a few minutes, I watched them work. On one of the walls, there was a huge world map. It didn't depict any continents on Earth, but I could see borders and dots marking different cities. On some primitive level, I felt kind of offended that the people had stopped worshipping the camera. The scientists worked meticulously, but even though it fascinated me a great deal, they weren't that fun to watch. So I sped up time again, this time to a year per second. Everything started moving quickly in front of the camera, and suddenly, in a flash of light, the military facility was gone and revealed a city that was completely destroyed. I slowed down the time. I had no idea what had happened, but it looked like the city had been bombed. 
I could see skeletons of skyscrapers in the distance and there was smoke rubble just everywhere. Then I saw a bright light in the distance, followed by a mushroom cloud climbing towards the sky. I must admit that at this point, a sadness came over me. Over the time span of a few hours, I had accidentally created a civilization, seen it grow and then destroy itself. I couldn't see any signs of life and I set the speed at maximum. It only took a second for everything to turn green. The forest was back, just as pristine as it had been from the beginning. And now I figured that it was time to end my own life. And not as a failed man anymore, but as a failed god. I left the forest running on my computer and walked towards the window. My steps felt heavy. As I opened the window, letting the summer air in, I realized that I had forgotten my phone on my desk. I didn't want anyone entering it after my death, so I went back to get it. And something had changed on the screen. Somehow, mankind had survived in the forest. It had taken them thousands of years to rebuild it, just as if they had to start from scratch again, but the city was back. When I slowed down time, letting a few more hundred years pass in the forest, I noticed that the city was much larger than before. The skyscrapers reached further up into the sky, and to my amazement, I could see thousands of vehicles flying through the air. I used the camera to look around, and when I looked up towards the sky, I could see the lights on the surface of the orange moon. People were living there now. As I watched this world, now completely transformed from a horrific wilderness to what looked like a technological paradise far surpassing anything on Earth, I cried tears of happiness that I've never felt before in my entire life. I looked at the window in my office and at the boring primitive city stretching out on the horizon on the other side of it and then at the city glittering on my computer screen. I thought about my beloved mother. She would have wanted me to live. This was before I started writing this, my last words on earth. And I just clicked on import. It read, Are you sure that you want to import Sam Wilkinson into the forest? Before I press yes, I just want to say one more thing. If you ever get an email from a man named Leaf with a login to the forest, please say thank you from me. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.